I'm in New Zealand right now. <laughs> yeah, we're probably both in New Zealand while you guys are hearing this. Yeah. So this is going to be just a rundown of the bands that I was in before I met you. And Yeah. 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 And yeah. how I got into music in the first place. People ask me that a lot. You know, I got started in music seriously at a pretty late age of about 33. Yeah, mm -hmm. 33 was when I started exiting my previous career. So I was a software developer and a project manager, mostly a software developer. I developed front, middle, and back end uh, layers of software uh, from the interface to the middle tier to database procedures and stuff um, for a company that helped hotels maximize their revenue through electronic channels. That was the main job I had. Right, right. So nerd stuff. <laughs> nerd, total nerd stuff. And uh, there was a lot I liked about it. But there was also, I felt, I always had this feeling that, that I was here to do something more uh, in, in hmm. terms of connecting with people and serving people. And I was trying to figure out what that might be, like become a motivational speaker or write a book. I mean, I just felt like there was something more to me than this huh. num number crunching and all this logic stuff. And I, and I really liked the logic and the building of code. Like building code is, is a really fun intellectual endeavor. You know, you're thinking of like how, all, what are the base pieces that you need to build to like make them work together and, and debugging stuff is kind of fun in its own way. But at the same time. Yeah, no, it sounds hilarious. Release cycles are a bitch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it can be very stressful. And I won't even go into how that all ended, but it, it ended and I had about a three-year period where I was no longer working full-time for a company, but I was doing freelance software development for many, well, more than one company at a time. And at the same time, I was taking voice lessons and then starting to sing in bands. You, you said you wanted to, you know, find a way to connect and, and all that. Where, where did voice come out of that? <laughs> it, it was a circuitous route, honestly, and I found the meaning in it only many years later. So it, it sounds great to say, oh, I was in an unfulfilling career and I had this light bulb that I wanted to have this other life. And so I went for it. You know, that's very... Oh, trendy? It's a trendy way to paint the picture of your life? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, throw it all away and do follow your bliss. The way it really happened was I was laid off. I had some time to think about what to do next. I didn't get a job right away. I just spent some time just chilling because it had been a real horrible time for a while. And while I had some time, I thought, you know, I always wanted to, I always wanted to be a singer when I was a little girl. Maybe I should just take some singing lessons, you know, while I figure out what is next in my life, whether that's more software or something different. I mean, I considered becoming a lawyer. Um, so that's so fascinating that it wasn't that, I mean, this crossroads in my one career, I'm going to become a singer. It was, it was like, while I'm figuring I've got it some out, time, you why know? don't I take some singing lessons? Yeah. I always liked it. I sang acapella in college for one year until I got Sidetracked so by water skiing, and I did one year of musical theater in sixth grade. So that, and I did one year of acapella after college with the Sweet Adelines, which is a barbershop acapella group. So my entire music career, aside from piano lessons as a kid, was one year of musical theater in sixth grade. Oh, one year of terrible high school choir. Terrible high school choir. Yeah. Nobody could sing. And it, there were like six people in that class. And then one year of collegiate acapella and one year of post-collegiate acapella. So that was, that was pretty much it. So no, it wasn't like some light bulb that went on. It was yeah. just, I've got time. Let me just try some stuff while I figure mm -hmm. out my life. I took lessons. Then my voice teacher invited me to start a band with her. And we did. And then... And that was called The Fever, and that is a wedding band that still runs today, as far as I know. It, the website's mm -hmm. still up last I checked, which is not that recent, actually. Um, through that band, I got invited into another band called Girls on Top, with an exclamation point at the end, which was a three-female lead M Motown and R&B band, which Kristen Henry of Performance High is still in. Yeah, right, right. right. Okay. So, so, yeah. so back it up, though. Okay. So how do you go from taking voice lessons with someone? It doesn't matter that it was taking voice lessons, but it was someone you knew who was a musician. How do you go from I'm starting to do music mm -hmm. in front of people 
to playing in a successful wedding band that is booking gigs and, and so on and so You know, so honestly, I will, with some hesitation, I will give all the credit to my voice coach who invited me to start a band with her. I mean, we, we had some friction between us for sure, and I didn't stay in the band all that long because of it. That's where I got my full dive into the deep end of the swimming pool sort of experience. We were running our own sound in a lot of cases. I didn't know how to do that. So I learned that from her and just by doing it. And, you know, she was the one with the musician connections. Her ex-husband is still a successful, frequently performing musician. Mm -hmm. I, I got into it through her. And when I saw that there was actually money to be made in that, which I had no idea, I was like, right. I was like okay. hmm. Okay, I mean, see, I can't that's make... a part of the puzzle I haven't heard before. Yeah, but no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I can't make software developer money off this. Right. But I might be able to make a part-time livable income right. off of this. And it, it, it honestly just grew from there. I mean, I just said yes to every opportunity that came my way. I started initially a jazz duo with the, the guy who was the bass player in that band, who was actually a guitar player, hmm. but he was the bass player in that band. So we started a jazz duo just because I was like, let's, I want to play more gigs. And that duo turned into a quartet in the long run. It was called Dois, which is Portuguese for two, but we still kept the name Dois even when we became a quartet. So there was that. And then there was gigs with girls on top, which, you know, paid a little money. And so in the meantime, I was trying to figure out how to sing, right? Because this was so early on yeah. and you taking it Right. I mean, I was seriously. like getting paid to sing, but I was running purely on what little natural talent I had mm -hmm. and not a ton of great technique. While I was still trying to figure out what to do with my life, I, I was taking lessons from, from other people at this point, trying to find someone who could help me with my break and help me hit high notes and not strain my voice, which was not that voice teacher that I was in the band with. I ended up saying... I threw up my hands. I was like, well, fine. I can't find someone who respects popu the popular music that I am being paid to sing and who knows what they're doing. So I started, I was like, well, no better way to learn how to do something than to try to teach it. So I bought all of the programs that were out there for purchase at the time, you know, Singing Success and Mastering Mix and, you know, you name it, Jess, yeah, right, Jesse right, uh, Vendera's books yeah. and Robert Lunty's books and just... Eric Fry and Gina Diva. I mean, I bought. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah I bought yeah. everything I could find. Went through it all page by page and video by video and experimented. And from that, I picked up enough techniques to start teaching. And so I started teaching my next door neighbor, who was like 15 years old, put up a website, started getting clients, was teaching in my basement. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, what is my next chapter in my life? I've, I've got this plan B. I'm trying to figure out how to sing and I'm singing in bands, but what am I really doing with my life? And after a while, the software just fell away. I wasn't taking any more contracts because I was getting out of date and I didn't feel like I could charge money for the outdated knowledge I had. And I was doing so much music. I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll do this for a while. <laughs> and after teaching for about three years, I started thinking, I think, I think maybe this is what I'm doing. <laughs> this might, this might not be a plan B. <laughs> I, I think that is very worth talking about in that for most professional musicians or whatever, the story probably looks a lot more like that than a big break or getting discovered or mm -hmm. some big I'm quitting my job and I'm going to make it as a musician or die trying, you yeah. know, like it, it, that is the very real story of how so many of us get to doing it. It's kind of like just following a spark and following mm -hmm. what seems to be successful at each juncture. Like I'll try everything and then keep doing the things that work and drop doing the things that don't work. It's a cliche that we've all heard, but that cliche of how much of success is just showing up. Mm -hmm. And continuing to show up and mm -hmm. just continuing to show up and finding other places to show up and showing up for that. You know, and by the way, let's not let's not just one mention Girls on Top. Girls on Top is a <laughs> front range kind of legends. I mean, yeah. they've been gigging for 20 years. Uh -huh. People wait for those shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they play once a month or maybe more. Once or twice. Yeah, once Generally, or twice. Yeah. yeah, but it's very cool that you were a part of that band at one point. It was a lot of fun, and yeah. and I really needed stage time early on. I mean, anyone does. If you're not, sure. if you don't grow up on stage, you need to log those hours, mm -hmm. and they helped me log those hours. And it was a really fun, irreverent band. You know, was it Kristen and Dawn? Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah. you, Kristen, and Don. Yeah. Yeah, wow, that would be yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of flirting among us. <laughs> a little bit of butt grabbing on Kristen's part. <laughs> you, it's funny, anybody who's done those showcases where Kristen... I'm sure, you know, she's busy, but the ones she's done where you and Kristen were singing backups, you guys still have this thing where you're just like, hey, you'll take the, you'll take the, wait, no, I can't take the third up because I, I, I'll i have trouble with that. No, you yeah, take, yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. just like talk through and then you start singing and you guys sing like mm-hmm. perfect two part yeah. backups to just with. We're used to each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's amazing yeah. to see that come together with that rapport you guys have. I don't know where it falls chronologically, but I always found the guitar villains thing so interesting. So after Girls on Top, I was still teaching in my basement, and one of my students was Ryan Miller, who was driving up from Denver to Boulder. To That's come, what it was. To come take right. lessons with me. And Ryan mentioned that they were looking for a keyboard player, and I thought... Well, I'm not really like a keyboard player. I mean, I took piano lessons when I was a kid, and I was starting to write my own music, so I was doing that on piano. Mm-hmm. I could do arpeggios really well and some scales. And I decided to audition. And since I'm not a, like a, an accomplished keyboard player, I just practice the riffs exactly how they go. You know, this journey tune has da 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 or whatever it is, and I, I learned them all exactly. I found the patches that sounded the best. I came in, and I... I mean, I don't know if I nailed the audition, but I did well enough they invited me to be in the band. So wow. I became the keyboard player and backup singer for Guitar Villains. And that was a live band karaoke band. Live band karaoke band? Live karaoke band. Mm-hmm. Um, no synchronized lyrics, no backing tracks. It was just live playing and we had, you know, lyric sheets. And that was a community. That was so much fun. So yeah, we yeah. had we had a blast with that. Yeah, and that was, um, I gather, you would know better, um, led at least to a degree by Dave Stasny. Who's, yeah. You know. it was Dave, and, uh, Dave Stasny and Vernon Fuentes, who's now of my course, hairstylist. Of course, Vernon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were the right. owners of that band. What a cool guitar player, Vernon's. Yeah. Just, he doesn't play anymore. That's, uh, yeah, what a bummer. He's yeah. such an attitude player. Like, just like. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. uh, well, I, what was interesting was it was live band karaoke, and I'm sure this isn't all you did, but I think when I first saw you guys, you were doing kind of elaborate contests with like. Yeah, that was n- nearer the was end. Was that nearer it. the yeah. end? Yeah. Yeah. Before that, we were just playing about twice a month, always drawing a big crowd because everybody wanted to come sing with us. You know? And that's what I was going to say. That's maybe even the thing that struck me the most about the contest was how big of a crowd you guys were drawing. Yeah. I think yeah. the first show I came and saw you at was 500 people or yeah. something, four or 500. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they were events. Yeah, they were sure. events. Like, it was, it's a, yeah, it's crowded, crowded shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that must have been fun. Yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. And yeah. then it ran its course. And then, let's see, I also did some stuff with some people overseas. So for a little while, I was in a music career mentoring program, which shall remain unnamed because it turns out to be a cult. (laughs) It's some dramatic stuff online. You can find it. You can find it. I actually Googled myself the other day. I mean, I haven't done it in years, but I Googled my name to see what, what came up. And there's a lot of the stuff I do that came up. And then like on the third or fourth page of the results, there's... There's a mention of like me being like t- mentored by this insane person who I wish I had no connection to anymore. Yeah. Well, that's. But whatever. Yeah. But through that group, which had some European presence, I met some people in uh, the UK and in Germany who I collaborated with. So I did a jazz album with a violinist, extremely talented violinist, Pete Hartley. Yes. So we have an album called Oceans Closer, where it was essentially backing tracks with his violin on top and my voice. But the thing that made it unique was a lot of those tracks are instrumentals that had no lyrics. So they're jazz instrumentals, and I wrote lyrics to them and sang the lyrics. Really? Yeah. How did I not know that? You'll have to hear them. They're pretty cool. I, I'm still proud of them. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. And so when I went over to the UK in what, right before I met you, 2011. Okay. So 
part of the reason you joined UDT was because the previous guitar player was so pissed that I was going away for three weeks. Right. So I went away to uh, the UK and Germany and Spain, Spain for three weeks yeah. in 2011. And as part of that, I, I did a couple gigs with Pete Hartley in the UK. Right. And we sold some of those CDs on the street. Wow. In like Stratford upon Avon. Huh. <laughs> anyway. I, I, yeah. And, and then, uh, what is Panos? Yeah. Panos is part of that group too. He's, uh, Greek, but he lives in Germany, has a German family. And we did some collaboration, mostly remotely. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like, I was, he would write track beds and I would write lyrics and harmonies and record them at home. And then we recorded a video when I was at his house in 2011. Um, it's up there, and and I still love that one too. There's a couple songs still on YouTube that I love that yeah, we did together. Yeah, I have to go back. I have heard some of the Panos stuff. Yeah, um, it's beautiful. Yeah, I really love it. Yeah, what a talented. Um, oh yeah, he engineer plays here and yeah, and and now works for Salamone, mm-hmm. who makes uh, Melodyne. Mm-hmm. Um, so thanks, yeah. Panos, for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, he got us some some licenses. Yeah, and uh, and what a cool job. I mean, he's like Europe. Well, anyway, so gosh, so you're over in Europe doing mm-hmm. some stuff, 2011. Uh, yeah, and then, gosh, I guess that's then a, when I came back. Then it was UDT, Urban Dance Theory, and then mm-hmm. we started Adrian O Band, and that starts all the modern history. Well, let's go a little further though. So that's the stuff before we started playing with some of the stuff that you've done without me since we have started playing together because okay. we play together mostly, but it's certainly not exclusive. I play yeah. with, you know. Yeah. Uh, well. So you were playing bass and you were playing bass with a band in... Driving Karma. Driving Karma. I, knew, I forgot. Yeah. And yeah. I knew you when you were playing with them yeah weekly rehearsal that was great practice for me being in a band right. playing bass um i sat in with that 80s band at two or three gigs oh one of them you that was a road date didn't you go do some crazy yes. road date with them right minneapolis we played at the republican national convention yeah <laughs> what are the odds of that i know <laughs> yeah well and then Jacob Larson, of course, yep, you've played yep. with for many years, yep. uh, uh, sung backup with for many years. Yeah, and, Kristen and, and I were backup singers of for course, Jacob Larson and, Band and, for and a while. And we talked about, I think, that the uh, Jacob's album release party, but you guys have been doing that for him for 10 years or so? Probably. Probably. I mean, we did regularly early on, and then we both just didn't have enough time because with her being doing girls on top and me doing Adrian O of course. band and urban dance theory, there was just too much going on. So right. other people have been his primary backup singers, but Kristen and I are doing a show. I think later this year, we, we occasionally cross paths when oh, we, when we so both cool. sub in. Yeah. So there's Jacob. I subbed in for rocket surgeons one time. As did I. You did? Yeah. Different, totally different, different show. But oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. It was at hometown for the holidays that I did. So that was really cool. Sammy couldn't make it. I remember that. It was Hometown for the Holidays, and you, you stepped in for Sammy on yeah. that one. And Joe Mondragon was in that band. Not yet an employee at Performance High at the time. But now... <laughs> now... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who else, uh, though? I can think of, like, so many bands I've seen you play with. I, d- I played a couple shows with Sisters of Rock. Also. That's right. Some kind of big ones at uh, yeah. Tailgate and... Uh, and the Taste of Colorado, I think. Taste of Colorado. Yeah, yeah Sisters of Rock and that whole crew, which is, like... 17 bands that's mainly I know. The same. Uh, and they're all <laughs> so the greatest people and, and their talented. bands are all great yeah I think that might be it I mean we played I don't know if you played with Mostly Harmless you probably didn't no I did a couple gigs with them okay so you know the pet, basically you know the Petty Nicks experience is run by bassist Vic Catchell and he also had another band called Mostly Harmless that was mostly other players, but we both played with that band a couple times. I don't think we ever did a single gig together with that Maybe band. Maybe that's it. Okay. You know, I filled in like a couple times, but they weren't gigs you were on. Okay. This this one's about you, but one of them was maybe, it was at the Lake House in Cherry Creek. The, what, whatever that place oh, is called. Oh, the Marina? Marina. Yeah. And Cherry Creek. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Marina. And it was, I think it was winter or whatever. So we were indoors in that big oh, dance yeah, yeah. hall and it was totally packed. And maybe, you know, and this is saying something, maybe one of the sickest gigs I've ever done. You were sick. Super sick. Oh, geez, that's saying something. And filling in for a four hour, like, oh. cover gig. Oh, I forgot one. I forgot the very first band I was ever in. 
I totally forgot. This is where it started. So, you know, the Fever band, the wedding band, was started with my voice coach. But before we started that band together, she invited me to be a backup singer along with her in Bola Abimbola and Wazobia. So it was an Afro pop band. I yes, of course. <laughs> led mentioned, yeah. Led by Nigerian artist Bola Abimbola. So we sang in English and what language? Nigerian, I suppose. And we had African dresses custom made for us, white girls. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the very first band I was ever in. That was the very very first band I ever sang amplified. That is amazing. So that was in 2006 when I was 33. That was the beginning. That's not that long ago. For how most people <laughs> would think of you today. That's not I know, it seems so worldly and experienced. Yeah. So that's the whole picture. That takes us up to the stuff that we were in, which we cover in other podcast other episodes, podcasts. which will come yeah. out in the next week or two. Is there anything you'd like to do next? I want to do your band. Yeah. That you've been talking about for a while. So that I've been talking about So like for a while. trio mm-hmm. where I'm on bass, maybe little vocals, and you're on guitar and a lot of vocals. Just to make myself sing, because yeah. I don't like doing it, but I should be yeah. able to do it. And a drummer. Yeah. And I want to do more music. As Adrian O, yeah. more original music, and I'd like to do the Adrian O Presents idea, which is themed shows that we put together. I think that, I think yeah. we will definitely do that. I think that could have a little bit of legs. The idea being, instead of a tribute to one specific thing, uh, getting the Adrian O guys back together, mm-hmm. uh, which we still play with those guys, and we just have <laughs> such great chemistry, uh, and that's maybe part of the selling point is the chemistry we have with those guys, mm-hmm. but doing Adrian O, which is you, presents a tribute to the 60s, and uh, maybe another time a tribute to the 70s, and maybe another time a tribute to the 80s, and maybe another time a tribute to the British invasion. I was thinking there could be this mm-hmm. cool, um, so these kind of themed nights where you just kind of go off interpreting the vocals of those eras. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it could be not era-based. There's all kinds of ways to go about it. It could be geographically based. It it could be genre-based. You know, and and just give us some flexibility to do a bunch of different shows, but but have them themed so that people who might buy tickets are going to know what they're getting. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad we we did this one. As always, this one's uh, sponsored by Performance High. (laughs) Voice and Music Studio, and Hertz Rental Car in in Auckland, New Zealand, who answered my phone call after 20 tries and said, no problem, we can change your reservation. And I was like, (gasps) Hertz Rental Car. (laughs) Hertz Rental New Zealand. (laughs) If you need to rent a car in New Zealand for a rental company whose name starts with an H, Hertz Rental Car New Zealand. (laughs) Just in case... You need to rent a car in New Zealand. Thank you for asking the leading questions. Thank you all for listening. Yeah. See you later. Bye.